So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Mike Morris. Mike is head of program for the eBio Atlas at Nature Metrics, and he's going to talk to us about eDNA working together to scale up the measurements of nature. And I'm really excited about this because it's a fantastic thing to be doing. <laughs> Mike, over to you. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, John. You've uh, you've set me up to fail now. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, as as has been mentioned, I'm the head of pro program for eBioAtlas, working for Nature Metrics in partnership with uh, with IUCN. And as everyone in attendance will know, biodiversity loss is one of the biggest challenges facing humanity. It's been mentioned a couple of times already this morning. And as Craig quite rightly said, it's intrinsically linked to climate change. And as Neil noted in his opening address, to truly understand ecosystem health, we need methods and technologies that are scalable and replicable that democratise data collection across all in society from local to a global level. So just to introduce Nature Metrics before I go into sort of scaling up, Nature Metrics uh, provides a DNA-based biodiversity assessment from our um, brand new laboratories in Guildford. And we currently work with six, across 66 countries to deliver biodiversity assessments from samples of water, freshwater and marine, ponds, etc., sediments and insects, and great crested newt, which uh, obviously over the summer was uh, was pretty full on for, for our lab team. Um, and importantly, from freshwater and terrestrial and soils uh, and marine environments. And more recently, looking into things um, around air DNA, which is uh, sort of new to being developed. We were created specifically as a company to fill a gap between academic research and practical conservation action. And we employ a large number of ecologists within our team to help our clients. We take simple environmental samples of water or soils that contain DNA of many different species, and we sequence the collective community uh, DNA to generate data across the tree of life. Because when we touch things, we leave DNA in the form of fingerprints and animals are shedding DNA in this way the whole time. So looking at a water sample, aquatic animals shed DNA straight into the water, while DNA of land animals ends up in the water through things like feces, saliva, or is washed off land when it, it rains. So our rivers and our lakes and our oceans are like soups of genetic material for all species that live in and around them. And we can capture these traces by simply filtering out of water. And as I mentioned, soils, but I'll come back to that. And it gives quite an astonishing amount of data. Just uh, a couple of simple examples. Um, one from the River Froome in Dorset. This was a comparative uh, approach looking at the sensitivity of eDNA against conventional methods, in this case, electrofishing uh, sampling. And what we found um, was that eDNA picked up all the species recorded in electrofishing um, between 2002 and, and 2018. Um, and Several species were picked up by, elect uh, by eDNA that weren't consistently picked up by electrofishing, such as bottom dwelling species, such as sticklebacks and stone notes. Now, I'm not here to tell you that eDNA is the, the be all and end all because we know that um, you know, electrofishing allows you to look at the health of the individual fish. And it won't tell you, for example, whether you have a salmon par or an adult, but it gives you a huge amount of data at speed in a, in a health and safety uh, sense as well that gives you a huge amount of opportunity to, to understand it. As another example, looking at soil biodiversity on the land holding in Scotland in this particular case, we're focused on uh, analysis of 42 samples across uh, different habitat types looking for fungi and soil fauna. And in this instance, we found more than a thousand uh, species of fungi and 350 um, species of fauna, which obviously using other techniques you just wouldn't really find with the most diversity of, uh, of those species in peat bogs and the least in conifer plantations. And anybody who's worked in those environments will probably not be surprised. And as well as looking at basic diversity metrics in terms of number of species, as was asked earlier, we can also look at how communities, not just species, vary across the landscape, because it's obviously dangerous to assume that just because a habitat has fewer species, it's less important for biodiversity. Those species or communities are specialists in those habitats, and aren't found anywhere else in the landscape, then that habitat has a very high biodiversity value and potentially other ecosystem services as well. And we can see that there are different communities and species of fauna, uh, um, of soil fauna and fungi across the uh, in the bog compared to the woodlands. And you can see the finer detail when you look into, into the species as well. As a greater example in terms of scale, which is what I'm talking about today, 
Um, this is not a UK based example because we don't have river dolphins, uh, sadly, but this is an example from the Maranion River in northern Peru, where for the same effort that it took the WWF Peru team, including volunteer community scientists, not citizen scientists, I agree with that comment, um, to conduct their regular surveys for just one species of river dolphin, eDNA samples along the same uh, length of river allowed them to map the distribution of over 600 vertebrate species, including, as you can see there, um, 375 species of fish, including endangered species and a huge amount of terrestrial biodiversity from jaguars to monkeys and bats that they just wouldn't have found using these methods. It would have taken many years and multiple millions of pounds to have done. These data provide the WWF team with immense knowledge to put into practical action regarding habitat protection, um, connectivity gaps for species and differences between habitat types. And it was this project that really started us thinking about how to roll eDNA assessment into a much larger scale. Because as Craig mentioned, um, this is urgently needed right now, partly because we're starting to see many sectors galvanizing around the world to address biodiversity loss with real urgency, for example, around development and financial inst inst institutions and investments, and even then to integrate nature into global economic models. But in most places in the world, there is an uh, and with an enormous amount of effort by many people, we still lack anything like the amount of data that we really need to enable these meaningful goals and targets to be set and for progress in meeting them to be measured. And in some cases, gold standard data sets like IUCN's Red List can be remarkably out of date, which is the reason that we're working in partnership. And I found this out firsthand um, in terms of writing funding applications in my previous role as the chief executive of the Seven Rivers Trust, looking at Allosophallax, species of herring, that is a species named in the Seven Estuary SAC designation, but for which there was no information uh, or certainly no up to date information uh, in, in the UK sort of um, data. And this is where eBioAtlas comes in. So when looking at freshwater habitats, um, eBioAtlas is was launched in April last year, where we got together with IUCN's Freshwater Biodiversity Group and came out with the idea to roll these kind of surveys out across the world to provide global biodiversity data layer. This was launched in summer, and Craig basically summarised in his his five uh, points how this project was designed to work. So thank you, to Craig, for that. EDNA really is a total game changer here for IUCN in particular as a partner on this project um, because it will allow them to update their red list at speed within three years, looking at huge number of species and a huge number of uh, um, locations around the world. Our goal is to collect around 30,000 samples, which I will state now is not enough for a global biodiversity health metric, whether it be freshwater or anything else, but it's moving us in that direction. And it will, because it will also bring in vast amounts of other eDNA data from multiple sources, such as research institutions and private companies, such as Anglo-American, which will be verified by experts to ensure that it's um, it's suitable for adding into a global eDNA base. Again, the database again has been mentioned. And collection for this data will be through very simple kits and used in conjunction with a field app um, to record basic metadata and hopefully where possible additional metadata on things like water chemistry and other um, uh, other properties and vitally this will all be done with a complete collaboration with local NGOs and indigenous communities in the locations where we work some of which will be the most biodiverse and globally threatened regions in the world because what makes eDNA truly really transformational is that sampling is so easy anybody can do it from school children to local communities to politicians to fishermen this allows us to embed local stakeholders, um, David's community scientists, at the heart of the solution of global biodiversity measurement. They will have this knowledge and information that they've helped gather and they can use it in their own way. Ebioatlas will couple mobilize of, this. Couple of minutes, Mike. Thank you, John. These local stakeholders globally to collect the DNA samples and that will be fed directly back to them. The first location we're working in is the Malagarasi in Tanzania with a local fisheries community. And it's vital that they have that knowledge because there is currently a, um, a hydropower scheme being looked to be developed in that location. And that allows us to develop um, insights at larger scales from but from the global up to the larger and feed into things like the outcomes from COP26, UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals and other targets. So the funding that we're raising will help to 
collect those 30,000 plus DNA samples, and we're currently building an interoperable digital infrastructure to house that database and enable its integration with other platforms, such as the Red List and GBIF. And we're also collecting barcodes to complete, to fill more of the global reference libraries, which are in certain locations very weak, and crucially supporting communities to collect that data to allow them to understand the sustainable resource management in their locations. And vitally, this data will be freely available for not-for-profit conservation, uh, conservation and research purposes with a financial sustainable financial model added in. Because the great thing about eDNA-based um, biodiversity monitoring is that the scale of information needs to be ramped up. And we're now looking at how that data can be used to para parameterize, word I can't say, remote sensing to bring in other technology, modeling, machine learning and AI to predict ecosystem health and change. And just finally, um, as an example, in terms of this scaling up, it's looking not just terms of data collection and availability and scaling, but in terms of its future use where we can use go from in situ point samples to whole river basins using models such as the Edith model, which uh, I haven't got time to go into, um, but I'm more than happy to speak to anybody about because we truly believe eDNA and eBioAtlas will be a game changer that we can shift the knowledge on biodiversity by empowering local people to monitor biodiversity and collect data previously unimaginable scales that will help us to unlock um, conservation. And I will finish there. And I'm, apologies, I'm slightly. No. Thank you very much for your time. You did not actually, because you, you, you started three minutes late, so you bang oh, on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we've probably got time for one. We'll, we'll take one question uh, to uh, to Mike. I'm sure there could be lots. We get a more general questions later on. But anybody want one question to Mike? That yes, I'm, I'm in the, the Google Doc. There are quite a few, so um, you might want to pop in there, Mike. But there's one question which a couple of people have asked, so I'll focus on that one, is about eDNA records being shared to the MBN Atlas and local environmental record centres. Is that something that there are plans for? So at the moment, the plans are to look at sharing with, with GBIF and possibly with IBAT. Um, it's actually a question for IUCN, but um, at the moment, because one thing I didn't touch on actually is that um, eBioAtlas is looking to be global. What I'm really keen to do, because we're based in the UK, is to look at having a, a, an eBioAtlas specifically for the UK, in which case that kind of data could be looked at to be shared in that way. But it, it needs, as has been mentioned um, by Craig, and, and as I mentioned earlier, it needs to be in a source that is openly available to, to make sure that people can have access to it. Exactly how that's done and where it's shared to in in in, in a freely accessible form um, is still to be determined. This, even though we launched in July, it's still early days. Um, but but I'm more than happy to to come back on that.